Let's take a look at some methods that are used for studying the brain. For each of the methods that we'll look at, we'll be interested in two kinds of information. First, we'll be interested in whether the method can tell us where in the brain a particular process is occurring. Second, and perhaps more importantly, we'll want to know when does that particular area of the brain begin to participate in that activity or process? Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or fMRI, was invented in about 1991, and it's an extension of the procedure MRI, but combined with software that allows researchers to track the blood flow in the brain. Researchers rely on the muscle metaphor of blood flow. When you work a muscle really hard, the blood flow there increases to provide resources, energy, to the cells and the muscles that are being worked. So the logic in fMRI, and also you'll see in PET scanning, is that where you have more blood flow, it's assumed you have more metabolic activity and the brain is pumping in more resources to that area that's being worked very hard. The resulting brain scans that you get from fMRI show you in color the levels of brain activity and so a blue area may be less activated than an area in yellow and yellow may be less activated getting less blood flow than the areas in the dark red. During an fMRI scanning session, a participant may be asked to perform a cognitive task. Let's say it's looking at images, photographs, and thinking about what they would call that particular image. The scanning session would last maybe two to three minutes, and the resulting brain scans reflect a com combination of what's happening in the brain during that entire time. So in terms of telling us where in the brain an activity or process is occurring, fMRI is number one. It gets a first place ribbon. It may surprise you that fMRI does not do great. It's not number one when it comes to telling us when a process is occurring in the brain or how quickly the process begins to occur in the brain. In fact, there is a method that beats fMRI. As with MRI, not everyone can have this kind of scan because you are exposed to a magnet. So if you have any metal in your body whatsoever, it could be a danger to your health and even perhaps a danger to your life. So no shrapnel, no pacemakers, no aneurysm clips, no surgical devices, no metallic tattoos. If you've had a job as a welder, you might not be able to have an MRI or fMRI. If you've painted a lot using lead-based paints, you might have some of that lead embedded in your skin and not know it. So this is very important before the procedure to make sure you go through the checklist with the radiologist. fMRI is very popular among cognitive neuroscience researchers because you can easily start to investigate what brain locations seem to be highly active when you do a particular cognitive task, such as face recognition. In this image, you see the fusiform face area, which is located in the right hemisphere, very lit up, and this particular participant has just completed the task of looking at a lot of faces, uh, let's say famous faces, and thinking about who do those faces belong to. Another popular technique among cognitive neuroscience researchers is positron emission tomography, otherwise called PET scanning. In PET scanning, a radioactive isotope, often glucose, but maybe something else like oxygen or even something else, is injected into the bloodstream. And a detector will measure where that isotope flows with the bloodstream throughout the body. During a PET scanning research session, a participant would be injected with the isotope and then allowed to wait for about 20 to 30 minutes to allow the isotope to circulate in the body. And then they would perform a cognitive task that would take maybe two to three minutes. And the scanning would occur during the time that they're taking the task. At the end of that task, then the researchers can generate the brain scan showing which areas of the brain 
or most highly active and less highly active during that two to three minute period. Here we have some scans from PET scanning sessions. And as before with fMRI, the colors tell you how much activity is present. And when you see dark spaces in the scan, that means there is no activity, so dead tissue. You see much more dark space with the Alzheimer's disease patient than the normal patient on the left. But you also see uh, lower levels of activation for the person who has mild cognitive impairment. That's the scan in the middle. This image shows you the fusiform face area in the right hemisphere from a PET scanning session. So as you can see, it's quite similar to the fusiform face area image that we saw earlier using fMRI. So what would lead a researcher to do use fMRI or use PET scanning to study the same phenomenon, face recognition? The answer may be as simple as availability what techniques do the researchers have access to? Some researchers do all of their research with fMRI. Other researchers do it all with PET scanning because that's how the labs were set up and that's what they have access to. A second consideration is risk. PET scanning exposes participants to radiation, which over the lifetime, as one's exposure to radiation increases, so does the risk of cancer. FMRI is not associated with any known risks, so a researcher may prefer FMRI because of this factor. So let's evaluate. How well does PET scanning tell us where in the brain something is happening? It's really, really good. First place, comparable to FMRI. How well can it tell us when a particular process has happened? Well, it's not that great. Just like fMRI, it can only capture processes that unfold over many seconds or minutes. That's all for now.